Our first presenter today is going to be Megan Burr. So hi, I'm Megan, I'm a junior. So I will be talking about my project. For those who do not know much about the class, it's based around creative and innovative thinking where you can study anything that you're passionate about. So I love this class because it sparks creativity in school environment, like on the day every day, it goes back to resourcefulness, by making the quality of our students. So just a little bit of background about me. I am a all-year-round athlete for a very huge part of my life, and I would not be the person that I am today. Without them, everything I am came from these people and the lessons that I've learned throughout the years. So looking back at my life, I really try to what I was to me. Sports have given me the absolute best friends in the world that stuck with me. It gave me aspects of mental toughness, determination, and humor. And especially since the community with these people, they really are a family and that's what you get in sports. So going back to my project, I knew what I wanted to do going into this and I wanted to help people, but I didn't know exactly how. And at one of my games, these two little girls came and I've coached them for a little while. They explored me throughout. They really loved just coming and being around sports. And that's when I knew I wanted to help kids get what I have from athletics for my entire life. So after thinking and doing some research, I realized a lot of kids can't afford to do sports. The costs are absolutely insane. Personally, my sports before travel or equipment go over $3,500 a year. It's a lot of time to spend. So in my opinion, sports should just be a privilege. There's obviously all these health benefits with physical and mental health, and I think you should have access to them no matter what the financial situation of the family is, because gain all the benefits and results from the lessons that you learn throughout. So after making my realizations, I decided to create the Unleashed Game Foundation. This program will be providing scholarships for AAU and school sports, as well as covering equipment costs, so that families who are in a tight financial situation can let their kids play. So starting this program took a lot more work than I ever could have imagined. I worked on studies stuff to just kind of get the basics, like this stuff here, for my program. And this is when I knew that I really loved what I was doing because most people treat this as boring work, but I find it really fun. I smile and I love to treat class and really enjoy what I was doing. So this is just to break down at what I've been doing over the first half of the year, and for most of you, this probably looks boring, but to me, I don't need budgeting. I don't need marketing plans. I just do need making a drive. Something I'm passionate about, and this is something that can help a lot of people, which is something I'm very proud of. So now my program is ready to be launched, but my program mainly is split into three different parts that collaborate together to make the scholarship program. So the events and clinics are two major parts that fund my scholarship, which I also kind of set plans in place for that. So the clinics I will be running mainly fund the scholarship costs, but they also create a great affordable way for you to have really local access to sports. Personally, I take this ride to my practice every week, and it's been a toll on my family. It's really a pain. And most kids do have to drive for around a half an hour of practices. There's not much local access anymore. So these clinics will be run by volunteer varsity athletes and college athletes, as well as a couple coaches. I did it this way because I really wanted kids to have someone to look up to. Kind of like a role model. My team has had kids support us come to our games. They really love us, and I've seen that, and I want a lot more kids to have that role model in their life. So for the year, I'll also be running other events, like March Madness stuff and three-on-three -three tournaments. Events like this, I'm hoping, will kind of spread awareness in the community of what my program is, as well as raising extra money for the scholarships. So the most important part, of course, is the scholarships. I have set up budgeting in a way that allows for three different types, 50, 75, and full scholarship. This allows for multiple types of families with multiple amounts of money that they can spend to come and get what they need to maximize opportunities for everyone. So each scholarship is supplied specifically through one of our current organizations, like my softball baseball program. So you fill out an application through that team that you want to play for, and they put you in one of the three groups based on your financial situation. 
and from there you'll add it to the list so that you can plot for any other teams or you can plot for certain cost recoveries. So as I said before, these three parts come together, but the main thing that keeps them together is people helping me out with volunteers. I currently have a system set so that people can come and help out and do what they love and coach kids, but also make it a safe environment for the kids during the moment. So as I mentioned earlier, the tedious work has taken a long time. And over the next few months, I want to completely dive into fundraising and starting the clinic so that through the fall and summer season, I have the opportunity to give kids the scholarships for AD sports that are coming up. Another huge goal of mine over the next few months is launching a marketing plan that I came up with. As I somewhat mentioned before, going into this, I really wanted to learn about nonprofit business. So learning about this has been really interesting. I wrote a really hard marketing plan that I hope will launch. And the last important point I would make is the fact that this is not just a project for me that will end after 180 days of school. I really enjoy what I'm doing. This is what I want to do in my future. And I really want to keep this program going to get the full experience out of it because I feel like it really helped me. This is what I want to do with my life. So I hope that this has not only shown me what my project is, but why I want to do this project. This means a whole lot to me, and I'm really passionate about this. So if you want to follow my progress, you can check on my website, you can check with my blog post, which is linked to the school, and anything you want to help with, please contact me. So thank you for watching my presentation. Hi, I'm Chase Lindsay, and for my topic, I was inspired to talk about the surge in great white shark populations off of Cape Cod, and how it has affected the area, both economically and ecologically. Being a strong ocean conservationist myself, I almost felt that it was my obligation to do so, since the future of our environment could depend on how we cooperate with nature in the future. Sharks have ruled our oceans since before mankind, and are arguably among the most fascinating spectacles of nature. I've been diving with sharks for the last four years, and being in their presence has given me an entirely new perspective on nature. It taught me that we should respect their privacy in order for them to function properly in their ecosystem. However, the one species I wanted to focus on in particular was great whites, which I believe is the most misjudged animal in the world. Their apparent surge in population has noticeably affected the public sphere and fascination with them. I've been visiting the Cape for many years, but only recently have we seen such close encounters with these apex predators. Scientists and conservationists have taken good measures to protect these creatures from being hunted in certain areas. However, many people still perceive sharks as being one of the biggest obstacles on the planet, that they're killing machines and should be removed from their environment completely. It's unfortunate that people only listen to what they see in the media, because the way the sharks are portrayed in the media couldn't be further from their true identity. When the film Jaws came out in 1975, people immediately became fearful and began to demonize sharks. And from that, the Jaws effect was born. Envisioning sharks, the first thing we visualize are those intimidating killer eyes and razor sharp teeth. This gives us the immediate mindset of them being the devils of the ocean. However, great whites are rather curious creatures, and most attacks rather occur on, based on a mistaken identity of their natural prey. In the midst of my research, I discovered a shocking statistic that sharks only attack an average of 75 humans per year, with only 10 being fatalities. Meanwhile, humans slaughter over 100 million sharks eat on a yearly basis. They're everything from overfishing to shark finning. And to think that we're the ones who are afraid is absurd, to say the least. Surprisingly, politicians on the Cape are responding irrationally to the Great Whites. After a recent attack, a Cape Cod commissioner called for the culling of sharks and seals. These politicians have little to no knowledge regarding the importance of sharks to the ecosystem. They are only reacting to the fear of one fatality. My main focus is to how and why these sharks have resurged in Cape waters in recent years. In 1972, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, making it illegal to hunt seals, which had almost been decimated by hunting at that point. And as seal populations have gone up in recent years, the presence of sharks have reappeared. Recently, biologists with the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy and OSEARCH have been collecting important data on great whites. Their main method has been through shark tagging, through which they have been able to track through long-term migration patterns, as well as learn about their mating grounds. With some of their results, these experts have found shark migration routes often covering thousands of miles in only a few short months, 
from the Cape all the way to South Africa. They've also noticed that their migration routes can vary based on seasons and temperatures, which they believe is a result of climate change induced waters from the atmosphere. As for those who have tried strategical methods of protection, their strategies haven't exactly produced the best results in the end. The idea of netting to keep sharks away from swimmers was a failure because of sharks and other marine life getting entangled. This is among the many reasons why I've been so focused on trying to educate the public on what it does and doesn't work in our environment. And one of my primary efforts, as I said earlier, would be toward educating politicians on the importance of marine conservation. It wasn't until only four years ago that the Cape Cod Board of Selectmen decided to ban shark fishing tournaments in Cape Cod. And there's still many more places around the country where this law has yet to be implemented. Recently, however, I decided I would broaden my research to other shark species around the world, as they are just as equally threatened. In fact, unlike the great white, which is protected by law, other species such as the mako, hammerhead, and blue shark are not, which hasn't made them particularly vulnerable to illegal fishing in foreign countries. Such countries include China and Japan, who have reduced berry species by up to 80% in the last few decades, just with the demand of shark fin soup. For those of you who don't know, this involves the fishermen cutting the fins off the sharks and throwing the bodies back into the water to bleed to death. This must stop now. As for where I plan this project going, I hope to create a website that explains the flaws between our relationship with sharks and the ocean as well as create an organization that advocates for conservation practices and how we can safely coexist with these apex predators. The Atlantic White Shark Conservancy has been teaching Cape Cod locals on the behavior and physiology of great whites and how to respond to attacks. However, my personal goal is to decipher what exactly has been drawing more sharks to our waters every summer and how we can deter, with technology, any attacks or fatalities in the future. I plan to work with bridging the communication between biologists, conservationists, and politicians to work collectively for the well-being of our ocean's health, the safety of the public, and the conservation and protection of great whites. Many experts believe that the sharks have been sticking around near the waters longer due to the warming of our oceans. And the evidence does add up in the end. Ocean acidification has led to the oceans warming at a rate 40% higher than five years ago resulting in longer migration patterns based on the seasons. So let's let this be a new beginning for the future of our planet's ecosystems. These so-called man-eaters do not deserve their bad reputation, and the health of our ocean's ecosystems depend on keeping them alive. If we lose these apex predators, the predator-prey balance in the food chain will dramatically shift. Remember, fish are friends, not food. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Berkeley Adamovich, and I'm in the distribution class. To anyone here, I would 100% recommend this class because it makes me want to learn, not just because I have to. In this picture, we are dressed up for one of our weekly big to me days, and it just gets our mind thinking and to think outside of the box. For my innovation project, I'm helping improve the high school system in a positive way to reach all different types of learners. In the educational system, many find there's a lack of advancement, which I believe even starting with just one school can make a really big difference. During my beginning research, I went down to the elementary classrooms and watched lessons being done as I took notes for my research. I made three types of classrooms, book based, a mixture of both, and then all hands on. These observations helped me with my inspiration towards the love of hands-on lessons and interactive opportunities, and I realized that this was the most successful way to learn, in my opinion. In the majority of the hands-on classrooms, nearly 100% of the kids were involved with the lessons, showing excitement. These children seemed overall more awake and interested for what was planned during my time of observation. One of the quotes that stuck out to me was, I always look forward to school days because I get to learn and have fun my two favorite things, which was said from a student. Experiential learning has been around since 350 BCE when Aristotle wrote, for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. Schools were faced with the challenge of improving test scores while also staying under budget. This led for programs to be forced to be cut, for example, spelling and home economics, to focus their attention on creating a more lecture-based class curriculum geared towards improving test scores and decreasing the budget, which schools find to be 
One thing that needs to change is the weighting towards GPAs. It is unfair how the weighting is different for all different level classes. AP classes your grade is boosted 10%, and for honors is 5%, but CP are weighted nothing. One may ask, how is that fair? It is unfair. Unfair that students are punished for taking a CP class, resulting in not gaining any weight. This weighting pushes students to not take the CP classes, leading to over-challenging and overworking themselves just because they want the 5 or 10% boost, which in reality, some colleges don't even take into consideration of weighted GPAs. Weighting contributes to the stigma here at Sound High School how CP classes are not as valued. Students thinking that higher level classes will benefit them when it comes to their college application process. But in reality, colleges would rather see a student taking electives pertaining to their major rather than a written AP class, which nowadays the majority of students take, which does not make you stand up. As well as moving towards GPAs, field trips are also something that lacks but is needed. Field trips are one of the best tools that can be used to provide every student with real world experiences. Though money and budget plays a big part of the lack of ones we have. As stated on one of my favorite sources I found, a quote, whether that's a trip to the local grocery store, waterfront park, a library, a museum, a theater, a community garden, or a restaurant, each experience that a student participates in contributes to their understanding of the outside world. This shows that any experience can be a learning experience. Students who go on field trips become more empathetic and tolerant. A study conducted by the University of Arkansas found that students who participate in field trips to an art museum showed increased empathy, tolerance, and critical thinking skills. Along with field trips, homework is something that can get excessive here at Sutton High School. Over 44% of the teachers that took our survey on how many hours of homework do you believe you give your students per night stated that they do not give nightly homework. But one may ask, why do we still have a law? Teachers state it is necessary to do extracurricular activities after school, volunteer in the community, and better yourself in mental health. But it comes to the point where there's just not enough time for that, not enough time to do homework and things that you want to do. There are times that the time homework takes is longer than the actual class, 55 minutes. No study has ever demonstrated any academic benefit to assigning homework before children are in high school. And in fact, even in high school, the association between homework and achievement is weak. A source states, possible reasons include a lack of respect for research, a lack of respect for children, a lack of understanding about the nature of learning, or the top-down pressures to teach more stuff faster in order to pump up test scores so we can chant for it, number one. Other studies, have, other studies have found that high school students may also be overburdened with homework, so much that it's taking a toll on their health. To conduct the study, researchers surveyed more than 4,300 students at 10 high-performing high schools in the middle-class California communities. They also interviewed students about their views on homework. When it comes to stress, more than 70% of students said they were often or always stressed over schoolwork, with 50% listing homework as their primary stressor. Less than 1% of the students said homework was not a stressor. Shown in the graph, most students have moderate stress. Stress is a recent poll, in a recent poll that asked tens of thousands of high school students how often they feel stressed, nearly 45% said all the time citing relationships and teachers as the primary reasons why. How often are you stressed was one of the four questions asked in the Stress and Mental Health Awareness Poll posted by the social network after school. The thing is, school should not be stressful. For six hours a day, you're supposed to learn and improve yourself as a whole, and stress takes a toll on people's mental beings. My goal for this project is to diminish stress at school because it's supposed to be a positive environment. Something as simple as school that is only six hours a day should not be causing this. Putting a cap on AP classes is another way that can diminish stress, as well as spending time on homework. Students are taking a ton of APs, which mid-year are drowning in work. Increasing the number of field trips, decreasing the time spent on homework, and diminishing the AP weighting overall will help kids be less stressed, removing the pressure to take certain classes. Because of the false stigma that unweighted classes 
are bad or embarrassing to take, and that every student that attends Sutton should be taking more, more than two EP classes, which ends up leading, leading to over-challenging yourself as a person, drowning in the gear, which is false. Not all students should be taking AP. You should be taking the amount that pertains to you. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope I enlightened you with my ideas on how we can make school better for place and restore its true positive meaning that students tend to forget. I'm Sean, and the first thing I want to say is that I'm an ordinary guy just trying to get through life. Now, that, that all depends on your description of what an ordinary life is. Here's what I think my ordinary life is. Every day, I give my absolute best to be determined and productive, alongside being kind and caring. Some days, I even go out of my way to make other people happy, even if I do It's just the kind of guy I am. You find yourself just running through the same routine over and over again, as if it were to ever change or any sort of difference just gets stacked on which separates our days from good or bad ones. I like doesn't have that much to it, and I'm thankful for But the things we hold inside separate us from who we want to be and who we are. What I'm referring to are emotions. Some are good, while some are bad. We get to choose what we show people, and a lot of the time, that isn't easy or understandable. At one moment, we can be hopelessly lost in the sea of stress and pity, while it's another great problem. We choose is the point here. As I stand up here and give you a confident, driven speech, in which I was given months worth of time to complete and hone, I ended up squandering my time and thought too big, but allowed myself to fall victim to worry procrastination. It's why you don't see a presentation above me. And, uh, hold on. And I want to share this on another level that senses, pictures, and words can't show, regardless of the low grade or the poor, stressful chore to meet all the criteria which would prove the different false. My project is one that only one person understood that ever when I tried to explain it to. <laughs> and uh, emotions are very difficult to explain. In truth, it could have been that I couldn't properly state what I wanted to convey in an easy to understand format. But only one person knew what I was talking about, gave me the courage to pursue a dream, or at the very least, an idea. I want to make emotions easier to understand and make it easier for people to know just how unique they are. The point is, I hate how stereotypically a lot of us have become. I would like to express how this is important for our future. I knew this project would be very personal because, in all honesty, this is something I've been trying to do my whole life. Through stories and through experience, I feel like I can connect with people and forge stronger bonds than ever before. I always wanted to express myself in this fashion, and this would give me a platform to live that dream. There are harsh realities to what I've learned by spending months with a presentation I was making so I would get a decent grade. There's a lot of information that I just couldn't find like my peers. Emotions can be represented by numbers or statistics. They rely on peer-to-peer -peer experience and situations, talks, and stories. You can even learn from yourself, and generally speaking, there's no better resource than what comes from here and here, as corny as that sentence. There's innovative techniques that you can take a second to listen to. I want you to think, all right? Just think for one second. I want you to think about your life and the struggles you have. Now take one of those issues and try to solve it right now in the fastest way possible. I'll give you some. All right. Some of you might know, and some of you might not know how to solve these problems, but I guarantee you, if you look around and maybe you get distracted, you're not alone. We all find ourselves lost and alone somewhere or sometime throughout our lives, and it's hard to think properly and always be who you want to be. But issues like depression, anxiety, anger, and even meltdown states to take, dictate who we are. I spent a long time trying to figure out if I truly like this study, and the answer is yes. It taught me more than I think it could teach anyone else, or at least I can teach anyone else. I learned that sometimes you just have to accept the fact that society might not be ready to hear about your problems, and at most times, can't understand. My classmates are proven wrong. But that goes without saying that emotions can, can be confusing and also very manipulative if you allow them to control them. You have to find balance and grace to manage everything that comes from professions. If you can, you may just fall victim to what you want to prevent. Here's a brief demonstration that my buddy Max can make. This is Max. So this is Max. So, Max, what's one struggle you think you have? My girlfriend. Girlfriend? 
Yeah. School, all that fun stuff too. I don't know. So, got this fancy dancy textbook that we don't use. So, Max, this is a representation of your life. You hold it firmly with two hands, and you hold it close to yourself because it's the most important. Now, you're going to run a test with this, right? So, Max, you got an exam, right? You want to go to college, right? So, you got an exam coming up the next day, so you, gotta, you realize you got to study. Now, you come home from a long day of school, and you just want to maybe go to bed, but you know you got to fit and study. So that's something you really don't want to do. So now that you don't want to do that, you realize that you're having trouble concentrating because you're hearing your parents argue downstairs. Now you're hearing your parents argue downstairs, it's starting to affect you, and you can't focus on anything. So you want to get out of the house, and you ask your girlfriend to go out. So you go out, get dinner, then you realize, uh, why is she so timid? Oh, oh, is there anything wrong? Oh yeah, I'm breaking up with you. So now that she's broken up with Max, Max is now going to drive all the way home. He's feeling sad, but his car breaks down halfway. So now that his car breaks down halfway, he's got to call his parents, who are always in a bad mood. Now that they're in a bad mood about the fight that they're having, he Max has got to deal with that on his way home. Then he gets home super late because his car broke down, and he ends up missing his exam the following day, and then he comes home already defeated to two parents that already don't want to hear what they're doing. So, as you can see, back to the devil. <laughs> but, it's fine. The one thing you have to always realize is that you're going to have all these struggles and everything coming to you, and you can't always juggle them, let alone catch them. You have to always return to life to find the balance. Because it's just up to you by the end of the day and how much you can take. You can't always juggle all these issues, like I said. And it's time to do a lot of damage. You have to remind yourself that there are things that matter and things that don't. And finding that balance is what makes you want. So, thank you, Max. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to make your wrong. It's okay to suffer. It's not okay to do. That is something I believe in. The difference between giving up and moving on is that in one, you stop trying and you fail, and the other is that you push through, you take pride and strength in your own ability to succeed. You don't give up if you lose faith in your, in your work, or your social life, or even yourself. There's reasons to keep going and fight that next battle, but you need to find it in yourself. Because by the end of the day, the only voice that matters, the only one that will push you, is you. I could have presented a lackluster presentation, and one that less, and one that was less personal than I hoped. But there's one thing I want you all to take away from, the, from this and the words I've said to you. Don't give up on yourself, because you'll find that way to push through to get wherever you want to go. You just gotta be able to breathe every now and then, because emotions like the children. Do it for you, because no one else can tell you. Unlike everyone else's, mine's a little bit different because I will be discussing two topics. Um, I happened to change my innovations project three months into the school year, which no one else happened to do, and I kind of procrastinated on changing it, but I completely changed my topic and my goal for the year. So the first project that I worked on was my project involving non-traditional remedies, and anyone that doesn't know what that is, a non-traditional remedy is something that is not prescribed that is supposed to help you with something medically or cosmetically for a lower cost, and often for a more natural root. So some examples include hair growth pills, melatonin, and detoxes, and those may be things that some of you do take on a daily basis, but some of you may not know about that. So sublimation is a long-term treatment that takes at least three months to produce a visible difference, depending on your own natural hair growth cycle. Um, by choosing the supplement, especially for hair care, you can be assured that your body has the nutrients it needs to make your hair healthy and strong, and it won't affect your day-to-day -day life. So the first experiment I constructed was my hair growth pill, and this intrigued me for many reasons. I had always seen hair pills in magazines, on celebrity social medias, online, and I was so curious on whether they worked or not. So my first step was deciding whether I wanted to take a natural or synthetic root. So, how many of you have seen ads on social media promoting sugar hair 
Bistro, Little Blue Gummy Bears that all of your favorite celebrities use, or other brands such as Visical, which is used by Miley Cyrus. All of those are non-organic. So the only natural supplement that you can take is my So the first step for my experiment, I had to get a haircut. Um, my twin sister Berkeley was my constant because twins share the same skin, nails, and hair DNA. So we both got our hair the same length and measured at the hair salon. And the night after getting my haircut, I started taking the hair pill. And the only first thing I realized was it tasted awful, but that was something that I got over. Um, while doing the experiment, I was also researching other remedies such as castor oil for eyelash growth, tea boxes for weight loss, charcoal products, and then doing things like creating a waiver for my subjects, going into stores and actually looking at remedies. So up here, these are a few of the remedies that I actually purchased while being on my hair pill, but I couldn't test out any other things because I wanted to keep it so that I was only doing one remedy at a time. And um, so the whole reason that I decided to change my project was because I wasn't really feeling inspired anymore by what I was doing. And with my remedies, I felt like I didn't exactly have an outcome or something that I could reach because there are things that either work or they don't work. So I had a moment where I stepped back and asked myself, what do I want to do? And I realized that I do not want to pursue any career in the science field when I'm older. So I realized that I'd like to focus more on what I'd like to do when I'm older. I felt like my project did not portray anything that I was passionate in, and honestly that my project did not have an end goal. So after days of sitting, researching about my prior topic and also realizing what I want to do in the future, I decided that I was going to try to focus my project on business, which is something that I do want to pursue when I'm older. So my first step was trying to start a DECA program at our school. And for anyone that doesn't know, DECA is a membership that's available for students with career interests in marketing, entrepreneurship, finance, hospitality, and management, and it's available for people in grades 9 through 12. So many schools around us have the DECA program, for example, Northbridge, Grafton, Nitluck, and Uxbridge. But sadly, my plan felt hurt for this because we don't have the training, the funding, and it just wasn't available to happen. So I decided that instead I was going to focus my year on creating a business course for Sutton High School. So I decided that this year I would create a curriculum for the business class. And although electives are already set for next year, I'm hoping that I will be able to run this course in two years. So I've been studying separate sections of business, specifically the ones that you need to attend a business school, which are marketing, economics, accounting, finance, sales, entrepreneurship, international business, business management, hospitality, and real estate. I have never been sure before this model to exactly create a curriculum, so it was a bit challenging at first. The first thing I learned is when creating a curriculum, it's all about the students. You want to teach a class that the students who are taking the class are interested in. And as college board states, taking classes you're passionate about makes it feel like less work. And motivates you to put more effort into the class. So you give yourself for an example, sophomore year I took criminal justice class, and that's as much as I did enjoy the class, it was the farthest thing from what I want to do when I'm older. So I decided that my hope for the business class is that the people taking the business class want to pursue business when they're older. So the second step was creating a plan on what I was going to be teaching. I decided to make the business class a full year course and break up the year into four sections that correlate with the four quarters. The sections that are going to be taught are marketing, finance and accounting, and then the other two, for the other two quarters, I'm going to send out a poll later on and have people vote on which of the other seven types of business students would like to be taught. So for people that do not necessarily know what they want to do when they're older or what major to pursue in college, I thought this would be a great class and introduce them to something that is so popular in today's society and a major that is so competitive. So this would be a perfect class to take if you um, may be interested in business but aren't sure. So personally, I would like to attend a business school for college, and I strongly believe that if I did have a business class in high school to take, it would give me a better chance at getting in because it's so highly <coughs> And although I will not be running the course for two years, I will have to find a teacher that will be willing to teach the class. There's so many other things that go along with creating a class, such as waiting, how the class will be taught, what type of material needs to be taught, and whether it's a hands-on or more of a book or class. I will not be able to solve all of these problems this year, but I'm hoping to solve as many as I can. I hope that all of you will follow me along this journey, and you can keep 
up with me by reading my blog posts on a website called Medium, or you can find me any day D block in this room. I'm so excited to see what this class holds for me and what I will be able to accomplish. Hi, my name is Isabella, and my project for this year was to research and try out um, diet, different diets to find the best one for myself. I also want to help others have the best information possible to make a good decision um, on what the best diet is for them. What led me to studying nutrition was my parents. They both love to eat healthy food and work out, and that's just the influence that I grew up with. I'm a dancer. I've been dancing for 10 years. I train about 15 or more hours a week, depending on the week, so I have to figure out how to eat to get the most out of my body performance-wise. Dance has really helped me and has also played a big part in my interest in healthy eating. It has also helped me figure out what works for me when it comes to eating, and that's what brought me my project. The first diet that I tried out was a vegetarian diet. I was on this diet for six weeks, and I found that for me, this diet was easy to follow and also easy to transition into, for me at least. Um, I think this is because I don't want to eat meat as it is. When vegetarian, I felt energetic. I, also, I was even considering becoming a vegetarian full time after the study because I loved the way I felt so much. In my research, I found a study by the International Society of Sports. This study took marathon runners who were vegetarian and vegan and compared their health and performance to runners who were not vegetarian or vegan. This study found that people who are vegetarian or vegan have a higher QOL, which is the quality of life. Um, being a vegetarian or vegan also, help, um, also makes people more health conscious. The vegetarian diet positively affects exercise and performance and creates resilience against chronic diseases. During my research, I also addressed some myths or assumptions that went along with the vegetarian diet. Most people believe uh, that people on a vegetarian or meat-free diet have a low amount of protein, zinc, iron, vitamin B12, and omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid. And I found that well planned out vegetarian diets can easily meet all of these requirements. The biggest myth is that you don't get enough protein, which is far from the truth. When you are not eating meat, you can just replace the meat protein um, you are getting with plant protein, which is much better for you and reduces your risk for chronic diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. All of the research and information I find during my project, I put on my website. I put up recipes, healthy pre-made foods for when you forget to meal prep, my daily logs um, of food when I'm on my diets, and all of the articles I'm reading. I also put up my reviews for each diet and the pros and cons for it. Everything you need to know about my project is on my website, and you can use the comment section if you have any tips or advice or questions for me. The next diet I'm planning on trying out and researching is the vegan diet. This is when you don't eat any animal products. So when I'm on this diet, I will not be eating any dairy products, meat products, or eggs. And I believe that this diet will be um, hard for me because I do eat a lot of fried eggs or hard boiled eggs, and eggs are in lots of the food that we eat. Um, I'm going to be on this diet for six weeks and I will be posting my website what I'm eating every day with the calorie and macro counts for every day. After the vegan diet, I want to try out a three-day juice cleanse. If you don't know what a juice cleanse is, it's when you only drink pressed juice for a certain amount of time. Pressed juice is juice that uses a hydraulic press to extract juice from fruits and vegetables. This makes it so it will not go bad and has no preservatives, in which it keeps it healthy and organic. It also gives you um, lots of nutrients. The juice cleanse is a new health trend, so I would like to try it out and see what all the excitement is about and what the real health benefits are. I still have to do more research on this diet, and I will post more on my website after my vegan diet is complete. Once again, if you have any additional information, you want any additional information, or want to ask me any questions, you can come talk to me or email me through my website. And thank you so much for listening. For many people, film is just a type of media platform used solely for the use of entertainment. The glitz and glamour of the Hollywood industry is what ultimately drives the award, but it could do so much more. Film could ultimately serve the purpose of educating the youth of America with a bigger effect and impact than any school textbook. With my project, I would like to show how film can open the eyes of people. With film, we are allowed to experience the lives of others and are given the opportunity to educate ourselves through stunning visuals and creative stories. 
Unlike textbooks, film allows the audience to create an individual connection to the subject at hand. I'm Lucas Arnell, and this year, in innovation, I am in the process of writing and directing my own short film that is simultaneously entertaining and eye-opening on the subject of stress in school. I want to incorporate multiple styles of different directors I have decided to study this year in a cohesive and pleasing way in order to delve deep into the topic of stress. Stress in school is usually overlooked and is glossed over by students and teachers. I want to educate the masses by showing a realistic view of stress and the impacts it can have on daily life. In a realistic way, I want to show the everyday problems of everyday students. I have experienced stress myself and have also seen others go through it. I want to show how stress can impact every individual differently. Not only have I been making my own short film, but also making a curriculum for a film study class that could possibly be introduced in the future at some time. By tracking the steps I take throughout the year, I have been converting that into an elective for the future at some point. In general, I want to expand my knowledge of film to what I already know. So far in my studies, I have created an in-depth classroom plan for my film study class. This plan includes an 18 week course studying different genres of film, including comedies, horror, westerns, and many more. Through these films, students will learn to analyze and understand and write and create film projects. I want to modernize the regular high school classroom and introduce a new way of educating. After their 18 week course, they will start to they will start their own individual projects, creating their own short film on a topic they choose. They will take the steps that all directors take, including writing their own screenplay, script, and using creative camera angles to compose their film. At the end of the year, the students will present their projects to the school and receive a grade on how well they use the tactics and methods they learned. What inspired me to select this topic of film is that I have always been interested in movies ever since I was a little kid. I grew up watching multiple dramas of film from classics such as Jurassic Park and Jumanji to comedies like Ace Ventura and Happy Gilmore. Each film has been shaped by humor and personality and the person I am today. I believe I have a solid eye for film, which I got from my grandfather. My grandfather, Ivor Cornell, was a photographer in World War II. I believe his creativity was a big influence on my interest in the art of film. Seeing his photos and the process of what he took into making them always interested me, and allowed me to have an insight on how directors possibly create their productions. Not only have I studied directors in film, but also the methods and styles that each director includes in his or her work. This has been an insightful year as I have broadened my knowledge of the films I've watched and the process that goes into making it. After researching the habits and trends of multiple directors such as Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino, Edgar Wright, I now have the inspiration and a better idea of how I'd like to create my own short film. By combining the non-linear and character-driven style of Nolan, the dry out scenes of dialogue of Tarantino, and the creative transitions of Wright, I believe I can create a compelling, cohesive narrative for my final project. During my research, I was heavily influenced by the work of Jordan Peele and his work on the psychological thriller, Get Out. This film, being heavily filled with themes of racism and discrimination, opened my eyes to what film can achieve. This film helped me realize how I, a person with no experience in oppression, can experience through the eyes of someone else. This is why film, to me, is truly awesome. This is how film can be educational just as much as entertaining. Films like Little Miss Sunshine and Punch Trump Love can show the effects of depression. Rain Man and King's Speech can show how people with disabilities persevere and live their lives successfully. Through the performance of these actors and creative styles of each director, the audience can experience something they usually never would be able to. By using these films as a basis for mine, I believe I can show the, pers the perspective of the average high schooler. Films show the more Hollywood side of high school, with the good, with the good times and party, but I wanted to do the opposite. I want to show a realistic outlook on the high school experience and not only show the highs, but also some of the hardships of these students. Even though I had many ideas on how to create my story, I was torn on making my project a fictional piece or a more documentary-based film. I had eventually decided towards the documentary side because I believed it would be interesting to get real student perspective on the average school year. Also, I could use my investigative journalism skills I have learned in journalism and incorporate them into making my film. By doing a documentary, it would be interesting to compare grade levels from freshman year to senior year, and maybe even college students, on how stress changes year to year. I could also get creative by combining both fiction and documentary. I love the idea of a documentary because it could create a bigger impact and provide a better perspective on the audience. Throughout the rest of the school year, I'll be working on creating my own short film, as well as continuing my research of film. I want to create the best film to my ability, and to do that, I'm going to continue my research and discover more methods on how to make a great film.
These methods include storyboards, screenplays, investigative questions, and much more. I want to incorporate, incorporate as many of these as possible to make my film. As I go along with my production, I will continue to update my progress on my weekly blog posts on my website. Through here, you will be able to see my research, the methods I use, and how I progress as a film student. By comparing myself and my filmmaking knowledge from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, I can see how successful my curriculum can be on students and use the result to draft an updated course. When selecting innovations as one of my electives last year, I did not expect to have as much creative freedom as I do. You wouldn't believe the difference choosing your own topic and goals can make in production and motivation. By choosing my own passage, passion, it makes walking to Miss Mo's class so much more enjoyable and a great break from the regular school day. Thank you for listening to my pitch to Pucha about my innovation. With this class, it gives me real-life opportunities, like this presentation, to add them to my skill set. As a senior, I wish they offered more classes like this one throughout my high school career. Hopefully, my curriculum for a film study class can be seriously considered as such. For it is inspired greatly by this class on both creativity and self-controls. Again, Nate Wilson. Every child, no matter what, should have the special chance to experience the pure joy of horses and the happiness that they can bring into one's life. I also believe that they should have the opportunity, the privilege, and the sheer bliss of the sense of responsibility and companionship that horses provide to children. I've decided that I want to be a provider of that. I want to be the one to give special needs kids the opportunity that they deserve because I think that the opportunity is scarce. So I want to have something close and cheap, or in my case, free of charge, because for me, I solely care about the experiences that the children have. Now you may be thinking, what drove you to do this? Well, ever since pretty much birth, I've had some sort of involvement in horses. When I first hit the saddle, I was six months old and started showing shortly after that. I couldn't even sit myself upright, and I was on top of a thousand pound animal. I then got into working with horses on my own and training, I've worked with and shown a variety of horses from ponies to bigger horses, minis, draft horses, and even foals. Then I also have three miniatures that I've started on my own and or perfected and finished off their training. My point here is I'm partially doing it for my love of horses. I also have a love for kids with special needs and a love for giving them equal societal opportunities. I feel as though society is exclusive to individuals with special needs, they just turn a blind eye to them, and I want to do something to make these people feel like they can do anything, just like anybody else can. Since I have a sister and a cousin with autism, this is something I see frequently, which inspired SSPT, which stands for Sunset Stables Pony Togetherness. I bring kids with special needs together with horses of their choosing and try to get them to form bonds with each other. I want to make a positive impact on these children, or at least one of them. I started this on December 27, 2018, and the kids and horses have started their successful journeys together. I have six children in my program, ranging from ages 9 to 17. They have varying disorders such as OCD, autism levels 1 and 2, and social pragmatic communication disorder. This group of kids and parents have been absolutely a joy to work with. The kids are respectful and they're cautious, and after one session, I could see them connecting with their horses, or even the horses that they didn't choose. To see how well they work with them gave me great hope for the future. I now think that I know exactly what I'm working with, and I can look for activities to better fit them. Every kid but two chose two horses, one that they can ride for part of their time, and lead around and groom for the other half. And seeing the kids' faces as the horses came in for the first time was the greatest thing I had ever seen. But nothing is going to top the pure joy of the kids when they got their horses to do a difficult task. One boy did something with my horse that even I have had difficulty with, and he was near perfect in doing so, and he was overjoyed. He managed to back her up between a set of poles almost perfectly straight, which I've been trying to get her to do for two years. This project has definitely been an educational experience. While I've been doing online research, a large portion of what I'm learning is personal experience. But it's these personal experiences that are leading me to branch out to various sources and make sure that things are put together. But what I've learned as far as kids is about the different disorders. I've learned from autismspeaks.org that there are two different types of autism. And that one disorder called social chromatic communication disorder, is, which is where they lack in reading social cues, I was taken back at the fact that more often than not, it gets misdiagnosed as one of the two levels of autism. I took an experience with one of my program horses, Sadie, where she has slight anxiety and 
other things of that nature. And I contacted two licensed trainers, Clinton Jury of Clearview Farm, and my mother, Michelle Hunting of Sunset Stables. And I also viewed some sites relative to my project and found them very helpful as they gave me tips on how to work with her. I also reviewed some sites of facilities that run programs similar to this and have seen YouTube videos on making sure my horses are ideal for this type of work. Many of the parents in my program have asked what the duration of the program is looking like as far as the end. My answer to them was, I hope to carry this out as long as I possibly can. I don't want to end in May knowing I can do more, especially knowing how happy it makes the kids. One boy who works with probably the most difficult horse went home after the first day telling his dad how excited he was about his new horse. Reading that email from his mother made me realize that this is the perfect thing for me to be doing with my life. I've decided to study special education when I go into college because I want to teach special needs kids. And I think that it will aid me in the continuation of this dream that I choose to pursue. I want to continue to have this type of impact on kids because it's just so rewarding and I want nothing more than to make it a business in the future. I know this is just a start, but with a little more research and time, I will get to be something big and I hope to gain more kids and make my program well known and really get my name known. Not so much my name, but my program's name. I think that with more advertisement and the more that I push people to get other people to talk to me about it, then I'll be able to achieve this goal. My big dream of a few months is finally becoming a reality. And I started this from the ground up. To be able to say that is a reward in itself. I hope you took something away from this. And if you know of anyone interested, please don't hesitate to find me or contact me via my website. Thank you. Mental health is something we all have. No matter if you have an illness or not, we all have to take care of ourselves. Whether that's through yoga, meditation, doing a face mask, or simply taking a nap, we all have and need ways to cope throughout our daily lives, especially with the heavy workloads at school. But what happens when you can't control the bad and ugly? What if your skills don't work or you have none? I've been there personally, and it's initially why I chose to do my study on mental health, specifically in teens, and exploring the ins and outs that affect us on a daily basis. However, the thing that drove me to even think of doing this topic was my personal experience. I've struggled with mental illnesses for years, and still do. I wanted to be able to break this huge stigma around talking about mental health in what better way than this project. This class makes me want to kill myself. I'm gonna die. This is all too much. Oh my God, my anxiety is so bad. My OCD is kicking in. I'm literally going to jump off the roof. These are all <laughs> real things I've heard people say as I go through the day at school. It could be from anyone, any day, but they don't think about what they're saying and what it actually means. And believe me, I've witnessed more than my fair share of breakdowns at school. More people who just can't deal with the stress and the pressure. I've had numerous of my own, between homework, AP classes, tests, midterms, finals, friends, expectations, sports, clubs, jobs, family commitments, and more. There's just no time in the day to do it all. So we end up sacrificing. We don't sleep so we can finish our essay. We wake up at 4 a.m. to continue studying for a test. We overwork ourselves for sports tryouts. We're, we work a job until 10 and then try to get homework done. We end up so overwhelmed with all that we have going on that it becomes too much. For my research, I decided to interview students about their mental illnesses and it was eye-opening. This is a direct quote from a high school student. School is just a lot for anyone really. There's just so much thrown at us that like a person, that like a person with anxiety, it's just that much worse and that much harder. If every test you get that much more nervous for it, and it gets that much harder to come to school. And it just builds up way too much. Plus so much is going on and the lack of sleep is so hard. This is what is wrong with society. The world cares more about your GPA than your well-being. Talking about depression is emo. Anxiety is all in your head, get over it. Talking about schizophrenia makes you psycho. We categorize mental illnesses as something to be ashamed of. They would rather see a plastered on smile than raw, real emotions. We need a way to combat what happens to students during their days. Hence, I began to build my ideas together. 
I spent a long time trying to figure out the best way to build awareness and support. I knew that whatever I chose to do had to be done right, and that is how I wound up here. For my overall product of this class, I'm building a mental health week specifically for juniors in April. The reason that this is restricted to juniors is because of the huge presence of expectations placed on us. We are expected to be taking numerous AP classes and get good grades in order to get into college, which is another level of stress in itself. But for this week, the main focus is to have students feel more educated and more accepted for their mental illnesses. It is a voluntary week, meaning that students would have to sign up beforehand. I've come to school for the past year and a half dreading and hating being here, and for many more, this is true. This week is to make school feel more like a safe place, and to take some of the pressure to be or act a certain way instead of adding to it. There are at least two workshops a day, so that no matter when students have difficult classes, they can sign up for what they'd like and when they're able to. Some of you may be wary about how many people really need this, but from the AFSP, one in five people aged 13 to 18 are suffering from a severe mental disorder, and the teen suicide rate is now one every 20 seconds. We need to do something because no one wants to talk about this. Yoga is one of the many workshops that will be presented. An hour of yoga is more than just stretches. It benefits not just the body, but the mind. From both Science Daily and Psychology Today, they agree that yoga is a vital part of taking care of yourself. For the body, yoga reduces muscle tension, strain, and inflammation. It calms your muscles and relieves pain, but for the mind, it does an abundance more. It increases body awareness, relieves stress, sharpens attention and concentration, and calms and centers the entire nervous system. Through multiple studies from the American Psychology Association, it has been shown to enhance social well-being and helps with symptoms of depression, attention deficit, and hyperactivity, as well as sleep disorders. When done along with drug therapy, it can also improve symptoms of schizophrenia as well. Multiple sessions will be available throughout the duration of the week. Discussions will be held with students, new coping mechanisms will be introduced, and along with the activities, teachers of the juniors have agreed to not be home throughout the week. This should help students be able to take a break after school and they won't need to stay up and lose sleep. A study from the U.S. National Library of Medicine and National Institutes of Health said that children spend more time in school than in any other formal institutional structure. Schools play a key part in children's development, from peer relationships and social, social interactions to academic attainment, cognitive progress, emotional control, and behavioral expectations. All these areas are reciprocally affected by mental health. School is a vital part of our lives. We spend 13 years, 180 days in school. On weekends, we spend time doing homework and studying. 75% of students don't enjoy going to school. From live science, they say fewer than 2% of students say they find school to be a positive environment. I'm tired of seeing students around me having breakdowns. I'm tired of the stigma. I'm tired of people suffering. I'm tired of being tired. So I decided to do something about it. This week provides a break from the normal school day and a chance for students to learn how to take care of themselves. I hope to see all the juniors signing up when the date in April comes around. Thanks. Hi, I'm Abby. Um, for years, I have struggled with what it means to be fit and what it means to live a healthy lifestyle. And what I've come to realize is that fitness has no limits. It's not always a six pack, and it doesn't mean working out seven days a week. But, if, but for those of you who think that, this is for you. The health and fitness industry is more popular now than ever. It becomes such a big part of our lives that we but that we would assume you know what we're talking about by now, but it's almost the opposite. The problem is simply that many people are confused. We're surrounded by so many athletic trainers, social media influencers, and dietitians that our idea of what health and fitness is has become distorted. My blog is mainly directed towards teenagers, but is realistically for, any, for anyone who wants to live a better life mentally and physically. The blog has three categories. Better nutrition, better thinking, and a better performance. I post once a week and each post is research and touches upon popular fads, trends, and topics that I know each of us eat day to day. Everybody's different, whether regarding your lifestyle, body type, genetics, or even age. 
Now, everything that works for someone else is going to work for me, and that's what I want to get across to you. The changes that you want, the changes that you want in your life are going to take time, patience, and the application of the right methods. And now that I can't possibly bring each individual circumstance and lifestyle into account, which is why I don't want to include broad information. I want to pinpoint specific diet trends, workouts, and supplements like these that are constantly around us. To be better is to make constant progress, and that involves all aspects of our lives. People say, I've been perfect with my training, perfect with my diet, so why am I not losing weight? But unfortunately, that's not how it works. So you've been training for a marathon, and the day of the race finally comes. Mile 5 and 10 are pretty easy, you're going, it's a breed, and then you get to mile 20, and that's when you stop and you question whether or not you want to keep going. Uh, raise your hand if you think that, if you think that mile 20, if, at mile, sorry, raise your hand if you think at mile 20 it's best to walk off and end it there. Now raise your hand if you think it's the best to keep going. <laughs> the obvious answer is to keep going. So why are you quitting your training and every lifestyle change that you've made when you feel the slightest bit of resistance? Every day that you're at a lower body fat than you used to be is still progress. Your body is normalizing a lower body fat and your hormones are recognizing this new light weight. Just because the scale may not be going down doesn't mean you aren't making progress. It doesn't mean you aren't getting better at being patient, at, cost, at creating healthier habits, and at maintaining a substantial way of living. Everybody in this room is built differently due to our genetic makeup. But unfortunately, the way that social media seems to misconfigure information, we tend to believe that we cannot be and train the same way and get the same results. That being said, if you're afraid that your body is genetically destined to be small, weak, or fat, you can lay those fears to rest. While how your genes are programmed, you determine your rate of muscle growth, hormone levels, and places that your body tends to hold weight. They do not alter the basic ways our bodies build muscle and lose weight. You have the same capability that I do of reaching your fitness goals. Social media is packed with fitness accounts showcasing shredded models with big smiles and a link to buy their newest workout or diet that guarantees the same results. The unfortunate side of this project being online is that we often compare ourselves to things that we see online. We start to compare our own habits, even if they work just fine, to the habits of someone that we may admire. But what they don't show you is how fitness often takes over their life how obsessive they get over their nutrition, how anxious or guilty they get when they miss a workout, or how they won't go out to eat with their friends because they don't want to get their diet off track. This vlog isn't to advocate for obsessiveness. Its purpose is to introduce a healthier lifestyle and be a reminder for you to keep getting better. Good action consistency is better than perfect action and inconsistency. The ability to train and eat consistently is the most important aspect of fitness. It's the one thing that, look the, that the most successful athletes have in common. But there is one thing that can undermine the best of training programs, doing the same thing over and over again. Simply put, the more that you do the same exercise, the more that your body adapts to it. Um, simply put, rather than challenging your body, your body adapts to what has now become routine. If you've been doing the same training routine weeks on end and you're not seeing results, it's time to mix things up. What I want people to realize is that doing great by your body pays off for your mind as well. When I feel confident in my lifestyle, I notice how much happier I am, and there's a reason for this. Not only does physical activity, activity stimulate the production of happy chemicals in the brain like serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins, but it decreases our stress hormones. When these chemicals are released, they interact with receptors in the brain, triggering positive feelings. What's crazy though that is that even with 15 minutes of exercise every day, your endorphin levels increase, and the more that they do, they become so powerful that studies have shown their effects can be comparable to counseling or medication when it comes to lowering depression. On the contrary, getting shredded shouldn't be the missing link in your life to make you happy. Most likely, if you aren't happy with who you are before you're in shape, you won't be happy when you are in shape. A lot of people who begin working out convince themselves that as soon as they look a certain way, then they'll be happy. But what they don't realize is that that look that they're going for can sometimes take years to accomplish. Fitness is a journey, a long one, and if you can enjoy it, then what's the point? This vlog isn't a, this vlog's purpose is to be the encouragement that those people need. Regardless of what you look like, make the decisions that will make you happy, because above, above all else, your happiness comes first. I want this to be a place of inspiration for those who need a little motivation and a little more information. 
And sometimes that means being brutally honest. I want everyone reading this blog to know that while all of my information is researched and scientific, what works for one person doesn't work for everyone else. If that were the case, I wouldn't be up here right now. One of the second ideas I stress is to be stress-free. Taking care of yourself shouldn't be stressful. That's the opposite of what we want. I want the ideas and the information that I'm putting out there to be a helpful resource. Some of it may be easy tips, and others may change your whole lifestyle, but the point of it is to make your life better. I've done multiple day camps where I help coach kids between the age of 10 and 18 on how to ride faster, corner better, jump higher. Currently, you can probably tell by my shirt that I'm wearing that I am a national champion, meaning that right now I'm the fastest 18 year old in the country. Now, why this topic? I chose this topic for my year one product because my whole entire life I have been riding something on two wheels. Since I was four years old, my life has basically been crafted around riding and racing. I plan my weekly schedule around riding and training and when I have the coach camps. It's crazy to think that a hobby like mine can turn into a job. I mean, just riding bicycles doesn't seem like a job that would pay well, but the best pro rider in the world makes six figures a year. What have I learned? I've learned a lot more than expected during this project. At first, I was thinking, I'm a pro. I know everything about bikes, duh, that's why I'm a pro. But that was not quite the case. I had a lot to learn. For example, I learned a lot about the different types of teaching techniques and how they work, like audio, hands-on, and visual learning styles. Technology is key when you're riding as well. Gotta catch those gnarly clips, bros. <laughs> what is my end goal? My end goal is to finish my co coaching curriculum and to one day be able to coach my own private camps. I want to teach the way I want to and with my techniques, not with somebody else's. I want to show the world that I can produce good quality riders with all of my coaching and teaching, but that's after my professional racing career is over to with. Creating my program. Using what I've learned from co-coaching the Cyclecraft Fitness Camps, it was fairly easy to start a curriculum. I have lots of years worth of experience in riding bikes that absolutely helps as well. I've gathered everything that I know and put it into this slideshow. Well, most of it at least. I put together the most commonly asked questions about how to ride faster and smoother, how to corner quicker and jump higher. From my research, of course, I didn't know everything about riding. So I did some research about what I didn't know too much about riding and racing. I tried to focus more on coaching styles and techniques. Seeing now that I'm new to teaching, I studied the different teaching styles like hands-on, audio, and visual learning. Personally, I use the visual demonstrations the most. I like explaining how to ride a certain piece of trail, and then explore the ride past the camper so they can see exactly how I do it. Then I ride fast pace so they can see how the technique actually works. Where did my information come from? Oh, my head, way ahead. Whoops. <laughs> Most of my information came from what I already know. I have learned a lot from just riding, racing, and being around my bike. Mechanics and guys who have been riding for a long time who will explain how they do certain things to their bikes to me. Whenever I go to races, I usually ask the fast pros how they set up their bikes and what lines they take down the trail to go as fast as they do. Some of my research sources, my first source was the second edition of Mountain Bike Skills. This was pretty much just a basic mountain bike handling skills handbook, very basic and beginning techniques. My second source from the, was from the OSI Outdoor Sports Institute, and this source described the different types of injuries that can occur from riding and racing mountain bikes. My third source was my personal banking knowledge, things that I've learned from my many years of racing all kinds of different bikes. Um, some of the coaching that I do, I uh, help coach the Cyclecraft Fitness and Darrow Camps in the summertime at Lincoln Wood State Forest in Lincoln, Rhode Island. At these camps, we teach the kids different techniques and styles when it comes to riding your bike down the trail faster and more efficiently. Other times when I'm out riding with my buddies, if we stop to look at a line in one section of the trail, I'll give them some pointers on what line to take and if it would be the fastest option for them to ride. My personal techniques? My research has shown that when I use visuals and verbal description, that is what my students, if you will, best understand, comprehend, and retain a technique that I might be showing. Personally, that's what works best for me, but I feel as a coach that it is also the best way for my students to learn. Coaching doesn't always go with a plan. Like one time when I was helping coach a guest, uh, guest coach at camp, one of the kids broke his collarbone, so we had to stop the camp and I had to call an ambulance. And 
I got to teach the kids how to stabilize someone when they're hurt or unconscious. That crash, believe it or not, was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> my, my racing career, my racing career is a long one so far. I started racing back in 2005 after I got my first dirt bike in 2004. I raced dirt bikes all the way up until I was 11. I switched over to bicycles because I didn't like the moto scene anymore. The races were long, the courses were super dangerous, and the risk was really high to win. Bicycles are pretty much the same, but a little less toned down. I found great success in racing bicycles as well. As you can tell by this shirt, it is my national jersey. I got this when I won the championship title in the under 21 age category, meaning that right now I'm the fastest 18 year old in the country. What do I do for training? How do I learn more as a professional? These two things are key in bettering yourself as a rider. You must know that you don't know everything. I have a personal trainer who gives me different workouts to do at the gym to keep my strength and stamina up over the off season in the winter. But during the dry months, I usually go out and ride my bike to train. But in the winter, seeing as there is snow on the ground, it gets tough for riding to stay in shape. So that's why I do intense workouts at the gym. I always keep my mind open to different options, and I am always, I have to always be learning new things to continue to widen my bank of bicycle knowledge. Race mode. What is race mode and how do I teach it? Race mode is the mindset that you put yourself into going into a race. You have to clear your head and hyper-focus on your riding. You can't think of anything else when you drop into that stage. If you get sidetracked, you can end up crashing or worse, breaking your thumb. It is pretty hard to learn how to focus as hard as you should when racing. Personally, I tell all my campers to clear your head before you run and don't talk to anybody. Focus on controlling your breathing and get your head into the game. Once you do this for a few years, it becomes habit for every single race run. You stop, settle down, refocus your attention to the bike and the trail you're about to race down. If you want to be the best coach, you have to have quality teaching content. But in order to get your name in the program out there, you have to be proficient in social media. Our research shows that people who promote their coaching and training services online are 88% more likely to bring in potential customers. I, I heavily promote myself, my sponsors, and my coaching program at the Psychocraft Fitness Camp on my Instagram. Sometimes I get offers to do interviews like the one in this light, which I think was a few slides back. Um, like this link to the interview on Pink Bike, the biggest news website in mountain biking. I've gotten lots of good exposure and people even ask me when I do my coaching camps and how they can get in on it. My curriculum, how did I create it and how will I teach? I used my mentor at Cyclecraft Fitness to help me with my curriculum. He sent me some of his research and his work, and that is what I based some of my curriculum off of. I used what I like, and I did not use what I thought was necessary. Most of the sources I found online were very dated, meaning that the technology is obsolete or unusable. Mountain biking has progressed ex exponentially in the past five years. The bikes have changed, the gear has changed, and the racing system has changed. I took all this information and compiled it into my own coaching curriculum, a binder full of papers with lessons, techniques, and riding styles built to teach anyone and everyone, no matter what skill level. Now, who will I teach? I raced in the New England High School Mountain Bike Association called NESCO. Most of the kids in this race league look up to me because of what I do and how I'm good at racing and riding. This is the better part of the students that I get from my camps. The students are always stoked to learn from me. Max Beaupre and Willem Cooper, my mentor. We always make sure the kids have the right safety gear and that their bikes are set up properly. Then we will go out into the woods and begin teaching skills and different ways to ride. This feels very rewarding because of who you are making these kids better at riding bikes. Sort of a physical representation, if you will, of your knowledge and hard work of riding around and performing well. During races, whenever I race, I will do small clinics on the racetracks. That drives the kids absolutely crazy. Beginning to practice courses with, once again, Max Beaupre. As crazy as that sounds, I get a lot of exposure from doing this. Nearly more than I do when I coach camps. The kids and even a few adults love to look at lines with me so I can recommend the fastest way down the trail. Don't get me wrong, I don't do this all day because I have a job to do. I have to deliver good race results for my sponsors and hold up my end of the contract. But with all the time that I get to do this with the kids and the adults, I love it. It brings true joy seeing the youth of the mountain bike community having fun riding and racing bikes, not sitting inside playing video games. Thank you all so much for listening, and I hope to see you some, some of you at my training camps. That being said, I have very, some very exciting news to share with you all. 
I have some sponsors who are sending me to California and British Columbia to complete, compete in world level events. I'm currently the 33rd fastest 18 year old in the world and I'm working every day towards winning my first Enduro World Series race. Thank you. So, hello, my name is Brittany and I'm the project is the horse injuries and how to treat them. I've been around horses for most of my life and so I was kind of surprised to find some methods of treating certain injuries that I have never heard of before, along with methods method of encouraging them. So first off, we can start with a common injury for horses, last three. Now some horses can just be stupid, yeah, sorry, graphic warning. <laughs> some horses can be stupid and get cut by something completely random. For instance, they could be rubbing their head on their stall door and get caught on a straight piece of wood resulting in a slice across their face. <laughs> in cases that are not so severe, <laughs> lacerations can be caused by almost anything though. Some are way more serious than others, such as a deep laceration across the knee or a slice across the nose causing the skin to break off. Now in these cases, you should always call your vet right away as these wounds can get infected easily. In cases that are not severe, where you may need not need a vet, I have found out that flushing out the wound with beta dynastogen is the best, best thing to do to ensure less risk of infection. In the case the wound is infected, I found that furazone, a topical cream, and SMZ-TMPZ, which are both pills you can get for your dogs and cats, are both great for treating infections. A common thing can happen to a horse's call, which is just a fancy name for saying abdominal pain in the horse. There are cases in which almost nothing happens, and then there are more extreme cases, which horses and intestines can twist and cause them so much pain, it requires immediate surgery for the pain to be put down. Symptoms for colic are sometimes normal behaviors that your horse might do, which is why you should know your horse well enough to know that something is off. A horse could be itching the side or laying down on his skull. Some horses may do that and be completely fine, but in some cases, those could be signs of colic. Other signs include the one of them. In most cases, we don't know what causes a horse to call it, but I've learned that weather may play a role. If there's a day where it's 55 degrees and the next day drops to 24 degrees, and then it goes back up to 50 the day after, the sudden drastic temperature drop may cause a horse discomfort, causing them to start showing the signs of the Another common illness within a horse is Lyme disease. This is a disease people can also contract, but they get the bone bone and bull die, and horses don't. The most high rates of Lyme disease for horses are on fall and summer, when ticks are most popular. There's also a theory around about saying lighter colored horses attract more ticks than dark. It's very important to check your horse regularly, especially during high tick months, to ensure a lesser chance of having a horse with Lyme. If you do find a tick, it's extremely important to get the whole tick out. Accidentally leaving the thick's head embedded can result in nasty infections. I learned that some symptoms of Lyme disease are lameness, swollen joints, chronic weight loss, hypersensitivity, lethargicness, fever, eye inflammation, or behavioral changes. Lyme disease can be serious and sometimes fatal to horses, so you should always call your vet so you can prescribe you the right medication. Lameness is probably the most common injury in horses. Caused by an array of things, but the most common one I found was lameness from overjumping or overworking a horse to the point where it strains itself too much. Lameness can also be caused by the simplest of things, such as, such as a stone lodged in a hoof or a bruise on the leg. There are instances where horses can be lame from more serious problems, such as a bone chip or a fracture. If your horse is never lame, you should always call that to determine the reason your horse is lame. When a vet checks to see if your horse is lame, you most always perform a lameness exam. In this exam, he will usually stretch out the horse's legs in various ways. He will then have the horse jog, which is a, when a leader trots the horse in a straight line towards and away from the vet, so he can determine exactly where the horse is sore. He will also feel the leg in the hole in picture of him. I wasn't going to play a video, but it did work. The next injury occurs over time and may eventually force you to retire your horse out to pasture. Just like people, horses can develop arthritis and in severe cases can make it harder for your horse to move his joints. This is quite common to happen to a young horse or any horse for that matter. Jumping can put a lot of strain on your horse, which is why you should work with a professional trainer 
to ensure the safety of you and your horse. Osteoarthritis is not curable, but it can be helped. I've found that some great ways to help prevent arthritis in your horse is extra horses run after hard work. It is also very important to make sure your horse has a proper cool down and proper breathing time to get back to normal. This next injury is very serious. Laminitis is when the laminated tears from the hoof wall, causing the laminate to press up against the pedal bone, forcing it down towards the bottom of the hoof, causing extreme pressure. This can be fatal to a horse, but in some cases can be cured with lots of time. There are a few causes I found that I didn't know. High intake of carbs and sugars may cause an overload in the digestive system, causing disruptive blood flow to the feet. Obesity is also a very big cause. Some symptoms of laminitis are very obvious. The horse will show an inability to, or reluctance to walk or move and may possibly lie down. The horse will also be visibly lame and will have an increased digital pulse in the foot. When standing, the horse might lean back on its hind feet in order to relieve the pressure on its front feet. The next slide is about an injury I got to treat at the barn right at. One of the horses named Paz had sliced his frog. At first, we didn't know how to treat the injury, but then I came to the conclusion that he had either stepped on a very sharp rock or someone had actually dropped scissors for cutting open hay in his path. To treat his injury, I first cleaned out his hoof and then applied some antibacterial cream to the sliced area, and then wrapped his hoof in sheet cotton to provide padding, and then proceeded to wrap an ace bandage around the cotton and hold it in place. Lastly, I covered the bottom in duct tape to make it more durable for when he went outside. Paz is now all better and jumping around again. Mostly, all horses are treated properly and are so spoiled, ensuring they never get any injuries. I hope you enjoyed and gained some information from this presentation. Whether you ride horses or not, maybe someday you'll see a horse somewhere and know how to help it. I also highly recommend riding a horse in your lifetime. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kira. I'm a junior, and with Innovations, I was given a whole year to do anything I wanted. When it came down to choosing what I was going to study that year, my brain went a million different directions. I came into this class with my heart set on a business-oriented project, yet nothing really went as planned for me. One thing I learned was that being in such an open-minded setting, rather than the structured curriculum we used to, helped me discover things I didn't even know about myself. After one of my classmates and I had two counter-arguing, passionate presentations about the role school systems and education should take in our lives, I decided this is what I wanted to base my project on. Are we studying to learn or are we studying to memorize for a test? How many of you could take a freshman year book up but be able to remember enough words to pass? Or even how many of you could tell me you remember how to multiply or divide a matrix? That's what I'm trying to change. Now I understand that all education is relative. Some information that could be completely pointless to one person could be something another person will use every single day in their future occupation. But what I really believe is that school should be a mixture of broader subjects with more in-depth ways of resonating with students. So throughout the year, I'm going to study the psychology behind some of the most effective ways of learning in order for what we're being taught to resonate. I'm going to run experiments on students, such as getting two different groups, two different ways to learn the same information, and see which method lasted longer with students after a period of time. A couple complications rose along the way. Coming into this project, I knew I had absolutely zero knowledge on psychology, though this has been something that interests me, and it was really motivating that I was able to incorporate it into my project because I wasn't able to fit AP psychology into my schedule this year. I'll cover this by including intense psychological research, consult useful sources of psych right here in school, such as Mr. Wandais and Mr. Anderson, and hopefully even reach some outside professionals. Mr. Wanderers and Mr. Anderson are both AP psychology teachers, and they'll be helping me learn about the basis of psychology and how it connects with the way we learn. In the end, my final goal will be to have a proposition. I'll attend a professional development training meeting and present all my research to the Sutton High School staff. My hopes in this will be to inspire teachers in the way they approach teaching their material to students. The first thing I did this year was jump into gaining perspective on how we began learning at a young age. 
My classmate Berkeley and I visited three elementary school classrooms with three different perspective teaching styles. The first class we visited was a so said more lecture based classroom setting. For most of the class, the teacher stood in front of the room and taught the students material on the board. Once did the kids take out whiteboards to practice themselves. What was interesting about this classroom setting was the setup for the students that seemed to be in place to better their attention and focus on learning. Rather than desks being in ordinary rows, the students sat at high desks, making it easy for them to stand up if needed, with fidget bars attached to each desk. The second class we observed was labeled an entirely project-based classroom. The whole time we were there, the students were spread out around the classroom, working individually or in groups. The teacher roamed around the room helping students if needed. This classroom had an array of options of environments the students could be comfortable in. Instead of chairs, every desk had a yoga ball. And there were several corners and counters set up to give the students as much freedom as possible with their learning. The last class we visited was a mix between a project and lecture-based classroom. However, this class was set up with rows of desks, even though the students were spread out working in groups. Despite the rows of desks, it looked as though there were multiple spots around classrooms for various activities. All these classrooms we visited were fifth grade classrooms, so it was interesting to find out at the end of all the observing that the students from one class in particular reported they felt more ready for middle school than the others. Not just material-wise, but maturity-wise as well. However, this information I'll keep private for research purposes only. After observing for a week, I did some research to back my opinions. A friend of mine mentioned something called the ILLL. I looked it up, and it happened to find something that perfectly matched the idea of my whole project, the Institute of Lifelong Learning. This institution is dedicated to those who believe that learning is not classroom bound, but it takes place throughout life and in all kinds of situations. The motive of this institution is to supply students with a sense of creativity and extra cognitive materials. What surprised me the most was the abundance of this institution nationwide. It is present at universities such as UMass Boston, Duke, University of Miami, Bucknell, and thousands of more locations around the world. Something like this should be more known to everyone, and I think it's really important to be seen as an essential in education. A lot of the first half of my year of research has been education-based, so from here on out, I'll be focusing a lot on the psychological portion. I'll also begin experimenting with and getting the opinions on beneficial learning with students here at Sutton and other high schools to compare. I hope to make a positive impact on the perspective of the teachers after this project and hopefully give students a more positive look on school altogether. If you would like to follow my project further, you can visit my website or follow other innovations projects on our joint website, which will be linked above. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel. I am the daughter of an independent contractor. My dad has inspired me to learn and think more on the topic of trade and how to show younger generations that trades are some of the best jobs out there. And I think I have found a good way to show younger students that not everyone who's college should be seen. I'm going to start with vocational schools, sometimes referred to as trade schools or tech schools are institutions that are designed to give students the technical skills to prepare them for a specific occupation. And while doing so, give students a jump start into their careers. Examples of trade schools would be Blackstone Valley Tech or Worcester Tech. These schools teach students specific skills to become carpenters, electricians, computer technicians, police officers, etc. Students are often able to go to a trade school for their high school years, but what kind of students do they accept? Vocational schools have been accepting the wrong students. They look for who looks good on paper instead of looking deeper for students who would do better working with their hands than sitting in a classroom all day. To me, this is a major issue. The students that could be successful are getting, aren't getting the chance to be where they want to be. There are many things that need to be addressed when it comes to the trading industry. Along with problems concerning schools, there's another problem. The older generation of trades people 
has many hardworking men and women that are now retiring, which is a great thing, but there are more retiring than there are entering. Chris Arnold is the author of a series called The New Blue Movie. This is a from his article. The baby boom workers are retiring and leaving lots of openings for millennials. There are 600,000 jobs for electricians in the country today, and about half of those will open up over the next decade. To me, this statistic is very um, On one hand, we have more job openings. On the other, we don't have enough applicants to fill them. I believe the reason is that many are turning to universities and thrive, but there are also many that go and find that college isn't for them. College isn't for everyone. Millions of good paying jobs are opening up in the trade industry. Some may pay better than the average college graduate makes, and there are also there's also the debt of college. The average college student, the average college graduate owes 37 grand, which is which has gone up in the last 13 years by $20,000. Doctors today have up to 10 years of schooling, and you would think that once they finish, they would be racking up the bill. But in the years it would take for doctors to become debt free, people in the trading industry would have ample time to pass them in the money they could run. Tradesmen and women possibly attend a vocational school for their four years of high school, or finish high school and get a job with a mentor, and learn as they go. These people get paid to learn, making their education virtually debt free, and also get a four year head start. There are many different paths. Um, though the two I listed are two extremes, and there are many different directions people can take in between. But why be somewhere you don't want to be? You can do anything you want, but make it the right choice for you, and be confident in the choices you make. While in my research for information on my topic, I had gone across a survey for middle school and middle students. It had personality traits that can match you up with, with a career that would be right for you. There were also many categories for certain jobs that require certain skills. But when I looked closer at the survey, I found that all the trade jobs were under the category of being a realistic person. Other categories were for people who were investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, or even conventional. But don't you need all of these qualities to be good at any job? This was the moment I realized that the problem wasn't the promotion of college. It had, that had put a halt on the trading industry. It was a negative connotation with it. I believe that the trades have had a bad reputation for far too long, and it's time we make a change. The kids that can reiterate facts back to teachers in class are called smart. But how can we as a society expect every student to be able to be good at taking a test being able to sit and take notes and listen to lectures or to even understand calculus. From this point on in my innovation project, I want to show younger students that there are many different benefits to entering the trade industry. I plan on speaking with 7th and 8th grade students, not to persuade them into going into this direction, but to show them that it's a great option. For more research, I would like to create a presentation and a flyer to show some statistics that they would know and also that many adults would know as well. As a 7th and 8th grader, I had never thought of these options and I would be glad to see that they will have the chance to. I would also like to create a survey for these young students to complete so that I can have a good understanding of what they like about my presentation to get some constructive criticism on what I can do better to help them learn about their possible career paths. I would be going there for most apprenticeships, and even though I don't really agree with many aspects of them, I would also be promoting vocational school. I would be there to show youth that they don't need college to be successful and that they can do whatever they put their minds to. Whether you're a person with no pressures or a person whose family is pushing them to be a doctor, Hello, my name is Sarah Richley and I'm a senior here at Sutton High School. This year I decided that I wanted to take innovations for two reasons. 
One, because I wanted to get a look into the nonprofit field and make sure it was actually something I wanted to do when I got older. And because I knew that this class would give me an opportunity to work on my own time and create my own career bloom. Because of this low stress environment, I knew that I would enjoy what I was researching and enjoy what I was learning. For my innovations project, I chose to focus on the nonprofit field. I wanted to create a place where I could work with nonprofit organizations to help find more volunteers and expand their outreach for people our age. Ever since I was little, my family has always pushed me to put others before myself and never to say no to something just because it might be new to me. I think that this is one of the reasons that I've always pictured myself working in the nonprofit field as I get older. One of the reasons that I decided to focus my project on the nonprofit field was actually because of the mission trip that I just got back from in Haiti. And just in case you haven't heard, me and a group of 12 girls went to Haiti last week with an organization named Be Like Brit. The preparation process for the trip and talking to our amazing trip coordinator, Shelby, really gave me an insight on how nonprofit organizations like Be Like Brit keep their funding and run their programs. Now you may be wondering what a nonprofit organization actually is. Nonprofit or not-for-profit organizations are dedicated to furthering their particular cause by distributing the income they receive directly back into that organization. This means that the company is not trying to intentionally increase their yearly earnings. They have a goal set to sustain their foundation and they make that money through donations and fundraisers. Any extra money that they keep goes right back into that organization. There are millions of nonprofits set in place all around the world for many different causes. Some of the most popular organizations around Central Mass are Girls in Worcester, Friendly House, and St. Jude's. My vision for my innovation project this year is to create a website that will allow for students to easily access nonprofit organizations in order to get volunteer hours for things like NHS and possible college requirements. So far this year, I've started creating a website which will hopefully become an access point where students can work around their own interests to find volunteer opportunities that will not only benefit them with volunteer hours, but they will also be able to do something that they enjoy. I've also been keeping blog posts where I document all of my findings as well as update the work that I've been done doing on my website. I also have been researching the type of audience nonprofit fields usually target and thinking of new ways to expand them. On my website, people will be able to pick the type of volunteering they would like to be a part of, and from there, they will be brought to a portal, which can show them different organizations where they would like their volunteering opportunities. Soon, I'm hoping to be able to get feedback from all of you to help make my website more geared around helping people in Sutton High School. So hopefully it'll be up and running for students next year to use. Along with my website, which will be connecting people from two nonprofit organizations, I'm hoping to work with Big Brother Big Sister in Worcester and the home base of Be Like Brit to interview workers and members of these organizations. Through these interviews, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get a better understanding for myself of what it is like to be a part of the nonprofit world and finding out the work that they do and also understanding the boundaries that they might need to keep in mind when working with certain groups. I'd like to be able to present the information that I found from these interviews in a gallery type fashion where I can have an expo of all of these interviews so people can come and read these stories and have an insight on the lives of these people themselves. In the upcoming months, I will be sending out surveys and research questions to help improve my website and further my research. I'm hoping that I can get information from all of you to make it as useful as possible for everyone here at Sun High School. Thank you so much for coming today, and I hope that listening to all of our presentations have inspired some of you to take this amazing class next year. Hi, I'm Laura, and for my innovations project, I am attempting to combine classical music with modern chord progressions. I have been studying music theory and applying this to piano composition that I've been writing in this very auditorium. To gain a better understanding of composition, my studies have been focused in beats and in rhythms. So 
why am I passionate about this? I grew up being trained as a classical pianist for 12 years. Yet I also value and enjoy pop music. I want people to be able to appreciate classical elements as I do, while also modernizing the genre to expose it to a broader crowd. If classical music is modernized, I assume more people may listen to it. In my opinion, classical music is overlooked in today's society. I am driven to complete this project in an attempt to revitalize it. My passion for composition has been a journey again of 12 years, yet I've never actually been educated in music theory. Continuously increasing my knowledge pushes me to learn and share more than I ever have before. Early on in my research, I discovered that different genres of music can be categorized by the location of their beats and their rhythms. As you can see from the stack arches, pop music has almost identical lyrics, harmony, and sound each time the chorus is played with ample repetition, while rock music varies beginning to end. Chords are groups of two or more notes played together to form a basis of harmony, such as presenting a C or E note together at the same time. I learned that the most common chord used in C major isn't actually C. It's tied between the chords of G and F major. These are more useful to the key of C because of their universal transitional purposes. Then I dove text for, head first into textbook music theory. I focused on basic notation, meter, and time signatures, just to name a few. With this information, I learned how to convert sounds and beats into marked notation on paper. These could vary to simple lines to actual notes marked on a grand staff or pianos. This is an example of duple meter that I learned from music theory. The long lines represent downbeats, and the short lines represent weak beats. Before my research, I didn't even know you could physically write down beats. Now that I can see the beats on paper, my understanding of the rhythm patterns has increased immensely. Best known as a renowned classical piano composer, most don't know that Frederick Chopin is responsible for modern classical development and style. His use of rubato, which is speeding up and slowing down the melody of a piece, proved to add variation and emotion to structured music. This method is still used to this day in classical music. And today, we can thank Chopin for his use of repetition that's made its way into almost all genres of music. A great example of this repetition will be played for you in just a moment, an excerpt of fantasy impromptu. Notice how he repeats his phrases in almost a compulsive manner, which could have to do with his use of rubato in combination with his repetitive nature. repetition fresh in your mind as you listen to an excerpt of the beats from Blurred Line. The repetition in this song is really hard to miss. Although each has a different sound, both share a style of repetition. If you continue to listen to both songs beginning to end, you would find that these are repeated throughout. This is my first song, The Willows. While writing, I attempted to combine the information I learned with respect to music theory and modern repetition patterns. My second song, Turmoil, focuses more on the classical minor elements, but it also contains repetition from modern chord progressions and music theory. research when attempting to write songs. I don't want to sacrifice my creativity entirely in order to demonstrate my research, but I'd also like to indicate that I'm using the information I've learned while composing songs. This balance is quite hard to achieve. These are excerpts of sheet music from both songs that are currently in the process of being edited. I feel that editing sheet music is the most difficult part of this project for me so far because I have issues understanding the software and compositions in general require immense detail and time in order to capture the sound that I want to relay on paper. So far, I've finished seven blog posts. These posts have varied from my own personal experience which, to sharing my research regarding simple notation on stacks. I enjoy writing blog posts because I feel that they allow me to express my own ideas mixed with my research. I've also begun to post YouTube videos of me performing my songs. 
When beginning this project, I thought that I would have more songs done by this time. I didn't factor in the time it would take to research, annotate, and build a blog from the ground up. The idea that I would have a music book at the end of this project just isn't realistic now because I only have two songs complete and one song in the works. So therefore, my project is progressing slower than I first thought it would, but this makes sense. The writing process is broken up day by day, and I have to make sure that I take enough time to write daily journals and weekly blogs, and make sure that my resources and work is valid. I realized during this process that research is just as important as the composition process itself. Now that I have a better understanding of the class itself, I would still like to perform my final songs at the Night of the Arts in May. But I don't think I need to complete a full music book. Instead, I would like to have my blog updated and available for those who would like to learn more about classical modern composition. I plan to continue posting even after this project ends. I would like to move forward, spending more time creating and scoring songs and less time on research. Although I may have less to show in regards to my work, I think this will be more beneficial to write more quality songs in less time. Overall, I am very happy with the status of my project, and I can't wait to see it continue to progress. Thank you.